Hi, welcome to Decoding Nutrition with me and Dr. Sid Warrior. This is episode number two, guys. Episode number one is already out. If you haven't checked it out, please go check it out on this channel itself. And if you are here for the second episode after watching the first one, give it a shot. Subscribe to the channel. There's going to be a bunch of more new episodes, a bunch of new stuff to learn about. Anyway, today's episode, Sid, is about the uh, eating disorders. Yeah, and what an appropriate uh, host I am for this subject. Let's start with... Uh, what is an eating disorder and you know how does one develop one so eating disorders as a group have been diagnosed um, very recently in the mm. last 30 40 years but they've existed since a long time mm. so the names that you've normally heard about eating disorders mm. you must have heard some anorexia Bulimia. bulimia yeah. correct yeah. so those are the common ones that people have heard of mm. So anorexia is, I think, a good um, a good prototype mm. to talk about eating disorders mm. because anorexia, the word itself means lack of hunger. Like oh. Orexia, orexin is the hunger hormone. Oh. And okay. anorexia is no hunger. But the full name of the disease is anorexia nervosa. Okay. okay. And so the lack of hunger because you are just nervous. Oh. Not because of anything else. So if you've had fever, if you've had COVID, you might have lost hunger. You don't feel hungry if you're sick. Correct. Usually if you... But if you're this sick. is not lack of hunger because of that. This is lack of hunger when there's no other apparent cause. You're otherwise okay. Your body's fine. There's no infection. There's no cancer. There's nothing else going on. Why don't you feel hunger when you fall sick? What's the connection between being sick and hunger? So when you're sick, your body goes into a acute stress response. Mm. And the simplest way to describe it is that when your stress levels rise, that is not the time to eat. Mm. Because your stress levels are rising because there is some danger. Mm. So that is the time to run. That is the time to fight. Oh, so your okay, sympathetic okay. nervous system, mm. which is the part of the body responsible for, you know, keeping you alive, fighting, flight mm. and fright response. Mm. That is not a time for hunger. Mm. So whenever you are sick, when you have fever, your inflammatory cells in your body go up. Mm. They tell your brain that, listen, something is wrong. Mm. Conserve whatever energy you have and let's fight. Mm. So at that time, you don't feel hunger. What is What are the two types of nervous system? The sympathetic and? There is parasympathetic. Parasympathetic. Correct. We parasympathetic, spoke about this last Yeah, time. we spoke about this last time. Parasympathetic is... When you are secure, comfortable, yes. you feel like whatever. Hunger is a parasympathetic response. Yes. Yes. Understood. So okay. sympathetic and parasympathetic always go hand in hand. Hmm. So parasympathetic lets you rest, sleep, eat. Hmm. Hmm. And sympathetic makes you work out, focused. Understood. And in general, all of these problems, eating disorders, even to a large extent sexual disorders, hmm. are all because of some kind of imbalance between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. I'm assuming that, okay, anorexia is about lack of hunger, but because the modern day is actually plagued with problems of abundance, yeah. there are newer eating disorders today. Yeah. Uh, I want to start off with what is a modern day eating disorder? Um, like binge eating. Yeah. What is binge eating and um, why does it happen? So binge eating is, an, is a phenomenon that can be seen in a lot of people. But not all of them would have binge eating disorder. Hmm. So I want to make a distinction between the two. Hmm. Sort of like feeling anxious versus having anxiety disorder. Correct. These okay. are two different things. I might have a stressful day at work, go back home, open the fridge and take out a tub of ice cream and just eat it once. That's not binge eating disorder. That might hmm. be binge eating. Hmm. Binge eating disorder is when you do this multiple times, hmm. say one or two times in a week, repeatedly for months in a stretch mm. and every time you do it immediately you're followed by a lot of guilt embarrassment shame mm. and there are certain characteristics of how you eat mm. so do you eat till you're uncomfortably full mm. do you eat way faster than you need to do you eat for much longer stop attacking me <laughs> You're just attacking me non -stop. even when i'm saying it i can <laughs> see you drift away and thinking of all the times yes <laughs> Uh, yeah. But yeah, so binge eating disorder and binge eating the phenomenon are two different things. Yeah. Why do people just indulge in the occasional binge eating? Which yeah. is, oh, if you're, if you're anxious, if you're stressed, 
Yeah. It's your, I'm guessing it's your parasympathetic nervous system making you eat. Perfect. Very good. That's mm. exactly it. Because it's like a auto correction. Mm. Because you are too stressed too, out. Uh, your sympathetic nervous system was flaring all day. Yes. So to counter that, it's your parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous, nervous system. system. Like, yo, you got to, you need some... You need some comfort and safety now. Yeah. So imagine if I could give a score for my sympathetic state. Okay. Mm. So imagine if I am in a sympathetic state for <clears throat> at a at a level of say 80. Mm. Okay. Out of 100, I'm at a 80 level in sympathetic state for six hours. Mm. Right. So my body is trying to, my body and my mind is trying to find a balance constantly. So I need to get to, I need to experience an 80 level sympathetic state very quickly to find balance. Hmm. For example, hmm. and that is what drives me to eat a tub of ice cream because I'm like, I need to find comfort immediately because I've just been through severe discomfort. So I need the same level of comfort quickly hmm. while it can be achieved through going to the gym or whatever else. Yes. Uh, friends aren't available. That so will take time. That will take time. Yeah. So I need to achieve it quickly and to the same intensity. Correct. As the stress, yeah. that lead to, leads to binge eating? Yes, so that's a very good explanation. Hmm. The 80 out of 100 is a good framework. Hmm. It can never be measured that way. Hmm. But it's great as a framework for yourself. Hmm. Because your 80 and my 80 would be completely different. different. Yeah. So there's no way to know. Yeah. That's number one. Hmm. And number two, your 100 would never be the same. Correct. As you grow, hmm. your 100 will keep on increasing, increasing. or changing Capacity or even decreasing. To to take stress. Yeah, sometimes it can decrease. Yeah. So if you've had a very traumatic experience, mm. suddenly your 100 has become your previous 20. Mm. And now you can't take anything. Mm. So the next time your boss calls you with some small problem, you are suddenly overloaded. Yeah. Now tell me something. The next question in this is, can you regulate your sympathetic state? Like how do you, how do you make sure that a activity which causes you to be in a sympathetic state, how do you increase your capacity to be in a sympathetic state? Which is, Effectively, in simple terms, I'm asking is, how do I increase my capacity to handle stress? Brilliant. So the word here is resilience. Hmm. That is what resilience means. So as you grow from a child to an adult, hmm. your resilience is increasing, hmm. ideally. Hmm. Your ability to deal with stress is increasing. What you define as stress is increasing. Hmm. And the difference between stress and trauma is resilience. Interesting. So what is stress to one person, may be trauma to another person, mm. depending on can that other person deal with it or not. Capacity. 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 Yeah. The best example is gym. Mm. So today you are able to deadlift 100 kgs, mm. but at the age of 10, 100 kg would have broken your back. Mm. Right? Because now your bones, your muscles, Every part of your body has learned gradually to deal with that stress. So in a way, if you want to get over your trauma, you just have to expose yourself to trauma enough times so your capacity to handle it goes up. In gradually incremental terms. Hmm. Very, very slowly, you have to go on increasing your limits hmm. so that if life throws something really hmm. bad at you, you are not completely taken aback. So you do need to be exposed. You do need to have repeated traumas. Sorry. You do need to have repeated stresses. Hmm. In traumas your is probably the wrong word. Correct. Yeah, traumas yeah. where it goes wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So stress is the right word. You need stress. You should avoid trauma. The only way to avoid trauma is to be stressed repeatedly hmm. in the right way. And this is why I see like, okay, so <clears throat> doctors who indulge in, you know, high... Uh, so, for example, I know some friends who are doctors who are surgeons. Hmm. Doctors who are surgeons who have to perform uh, under high pressure, which is like, dude, like someone's life is on the line. Yeah. Uh, so, when they're performing surgery, I heard they play some songs and like, they just want to yeah. keep the atmosphere light so they can balance it out so they don't yeah. get too stressed. And or traders, right? Like stock yeah. market traders who are routinely trading with crores of money in the account. Yeah. They just sort of get desensitized to, to like a loss because yeah. their capacity to handle handle loss keeps going up because it's the more they're exposed to a bad day, the more they're like this is part of the routine now. Like I can I can handle exactly. It this is part of the game. <laughs> so the reason that surgeons play music is not so much for themselves, although it is for some amount, but it is to keep everyone else calm. Hmm. 
So in the OT, there'll be five, ten people. Hmm. One of them might be an intern who's hmm. there for the first time, hmm. and that intern also has a role to play. Hmm. But the intern needs to see that everyone else else is relaxed. Hmm. So even if they see blood splur- spurting out for the first time, hmm. they are not going to get hmm. suddenly thrown into anxiety. Hmm. So they will see that okay, this seems to be under control. What songs do you play? <laughs> I don't operate, <laughs> but. <laughs> If um, I have attended operation theaters where they would play classical Indian music, ah, and it's it's really something else to see because everyone's smiling, hmm. the guys' guts are out, hmm. but everybody is smiling, laughing because they know that okay, this is just a routine procedure. Hmm. So hmm. that is how you keep your sympathetic in check. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, coming back to binge eating. Hmm. So binge eating is a response to high octane sympathetic activity. Yeah, in order for your mind and body to Create balance. It's like, what's the easiest way I can feel a parasympathetic state quickly? So that's why we binge eat. Perfect. Hmm. Now this is the baseline understanding. This hmm. is the root of everything. Hmm. Now we can add up the complexity a little bit hmm. because the other two diseases, hmm. which is anorexia hmm. and bulimia, hmm. are more complex than binge eating. Hmm. Binge eating is easy to understand. Hmm. You want control, uh, you suddenly feel too stressed, you want to bring back parasympathetic, you eat. Hmm. Now, in anorexia hmm. and in bulimia, the difference is that anorexia has on top of this sort of absurd relationship with food, hmm. they also have a strange relationship with their own body. Hmm. So anorexics think that they are overweight no matter what their weight is why they always think that they are fat so there will be say the typical prototypical anorexic patient would be a 15 16 year old girl mm. who's been in who's gotten into puberty maybe 3 4 years ago or 2 years ago and she's convinced that she's fat mm. she's actually skinny mm. she's underweight in mm. fact she's malnourished mm. she's not eating mm. Her doctors are telling her that she should eat, but she's not eating. Her hemoglobin is going down. Hmm. She's tired. She's weak. She still thinks that she is fat. And this is why anorexia is one of the most dangerous psychological problems. Can you connect this psychological state to our parasympathetic and sympathetic state, that framework? Yeah. Can you connect it? How How is that related? So the connection is... You have to add one more level to this, hmm. which is one of the things that makes you calm hmm. is control. Hmm. So whenever you feel that things are not in control, you want to get back control. Hmm. And the reason why anorexia or bulimia happens, there are multiple reasons, genetic reasons, environmental reasons. But if you break it down, that child while growing up, at some point has been through some kind of emotional stress, emotional trigger, where they felt out of control. Mm. They felt that they have, they couldn't control anything around them. Mm. And so the only thing that they can control mm. is food, mm. is eating, mm. because that is something that is still in their hands. Mm. And so their relationship with food changes. Ah. Now food becomes a way of gaining control back in their lives. So Mm. food becomes more than food. Mm. Food becomes like this metaphor. It becomes like a symbol. Mm. And while I was reading about it, I remembered how we used to read about these uh, freedom fighters in jail who would go on hunger strikes. That where food became more than food. Exactly. So when you have no other control, when you have no other say, literally the only thing left is food, Mm. eating. So it became very philosophical actually. Mm. If you go down the road. Yeah, as far as it's bizarre how nutrition and freedom fighting for country (laughs) is like. Right, but it's so connected. Yeah, it's so connected. (laughs) Because eating is so fundamental to life, uh, Mm. to human behavior, that uh, sometimes we forget that uh, that relationship can be, you know, emblemic of so many things. Mm. So this is the root cause. Mm. You have, you have somebody, 14, 15 year old, who's going through a lot of changes in their lives. Mm. They're anyway dealing with stress. Mm. On top of that, puberty hits them. Mm. 
now their body is changing they're looking into the mirror they can't recognize who they are there is no other way for them to control anything in their lives except through food and so they stop eating or they eat excess both are forms of gaining back control so if you don't eat you go into the anorexic mm. line and if you eat too much you go into the mm. binge eating line mm. and if you eat too much and you feel guilty mm. and you start vomiting it out mm. you go into the bulimia, bulimia line. line ah and all three are kind of connected mm. Mm. but the end result looks very different that's why they are diagnosed mm. as three separate things mm. it's the same highway but three different exits yes That's the gist of it. All right, good episode. See you guys <laughs> next time. <laughs> so let's go. Let's go deeper into each one of them one by one. Hmm. Okay. So we understand why people have a binge eating disorder. First of all, um, at what stage does binge eating go from being an activity you indulge in once in a while to becoming a disorder? Uh, so there is a criteria. Hmm. Uh, so DSM. Hmm. Uh, DSM five, which is the latest one, I think. Um, that's the board that classifies all the psychological illnesses, psychiatric illnesses. Uh, DSM releases the criteria for every psychiatric illness. Hmm. So, what is depression? Hmm. If you fulfill these criteria, then you have depression. Hmm. Similarly, when do you have binge eating disorder? So, you have a list of criteria. So, there are some four or five things. Hmm. Roughly speaking, it's those things are mentioned. There is mild, moderate, and severe. So, mild is if you binge eat once in a week. Mm. Severe is if you binge eat more than fourteen times in a week, which is more than twice in a day. Mm. That is when you have severe binge eating disorder. I've been there. Do you, really, I've, I've been there. Uh, when I was diagnosed with depression, where it was like, it was actually mostly cycles of binge eating and sleeping. Mm. Like I would binge eat in the morning, we get a nice afternoon nap in, and I'd binge eat in the night once again. Uh, gets even more heightened. Yeah, it it gets very heightened when life feels um, purposeless and like, what is the, what am I even supposed to do? Like that was, I think, two thousand nineteen, mid to early to mid two thousand nineteen for like six months. I put on twenty five kilos in wow. six months. That was my severe binge eating phase. Could not get out of it. Uh, badminton actually fixed that. Mm. Once I found an. Once I found a parasympathetic activity, mm. badminton I used to play as a kid. Mm. So once I started playing badminton again, it suddenly started feeling like, oh, I don't need to, I don't mm. need to eat to cope with other other shit in life. Mm. Yeah. So twice a day, go on. Mm. So that's one of the criteria. Mm. Um, the other criteria is that do you feel intense shame, embarrassment, guilt immediately after binge eating? Mm. Um, the the third one is do you have any control? Hmm. You will say, "I, I don't want to eat this," hmm. but would you still eat it? Hmm. Which is, which is an important thing because it's okay to want to eat it and then eat it, hmm. but you don't want to eat it, hmm. and you would still eat. Hmm. That is one of the criteria. So those are the differences between binge eating versus binge eating disorder. If you don't want to eat it, yeah, it's almost like an involuntary activity to just yeah want to put it in your mouth, just eat it. I've heard of descriptions of people saying that I'm trying to stop my hand mm. from picking something up mm. and I can't. Mm. That you remember that listen last time you had this you did not feel good don't eat it and you yeah. still see your hand lifting it yeah. and eating it. The voice is in your head saying this is the fourth cookie is probably not good. But yeah it's already in your hand and before you know it it's in your mouth. Yeah. yeah. So that's how that's how you differentiate. So anybody who's wondering if Do you have a binge eating disorder? Mm. Think of all these criteria, mm. and if you feel, if you are in doubt, just go to a, th- a psychologist. Mm. And it's usually accompanied by quick weight gain. Yes, mm. yes. So one of the one of the differences between those three things that I mentioned, binge eating, bulimia, and anorexia, is that the end result is different. Correct. Binge eating will have overweight. Mm. They will be obese. They will be you know your bmi will be more bulimia might be around the normal weight hmm. because they will binge eat hmm. but then they will also get rid of it hmm. using unhealthy means hmm. either throwing up or they might take laxatives hmm. or they might exercise or uh, you know do intense period of activity hmm. to bring it down hmm. and then they'll again overeat 
Okay, now that you mentioned bulimia, mm. let's talk about bulimia. What is bulimia and uh, how is it different from the other two? Yeah. In bulimia, the binge eating part is similar. Hmm. So you want to binge eat because you, you're stressed out, you want to bring your body back to parasympathetic. Hmm. That part is the same. Hmm. But like anorexia, hmm. bulimics are also very conscious of their weight. Hmm. Overly conscious of their weight. Hmm. They're constantly checking and they have this ideal body image in their heads. Hmm. So if they're not fitting into that ideal body image, there's a lot of shame, guilt. Hmm. Binge eating disorder would have guilt about the eating part. Hmm. But not so much the body image part. Hmm. In bulimia, the body image is very important. Hmm. Which is why they'll go to a great length hmm. to get their body back to that hmm. ideal state. Hmm. Which is why there are some there are some people who think that bulimia is a more dangerous condition than anorexia. Hmm. Because anorexics get diagnosed much earlier. Because they're visibly sick. Hmm. They're visibly underweight. They're visibly anemic. Hmm. They're not eating at all. They're malnourished. But bulimics look normal. Mm. Their, their weight is okay. In fact, they might be normal or slightly overweight, but it's in that range. Mm. And they may not take help. Because mm. everybody is complimenting them. Are you look good. Mm. So they don't realize that throwing up or using laxatives is a problem. Mm. So the average age of being diagnosed as a bulimic is much higher. So mm. 30 to 50 is the range of, range of diagnosis, the age. So how do you develop the disorder? Like the disorder is developed in adolescent. Adolescent period. Yeah, in okay, teenage okay. years. Okay, okay, okay. But okay. it's diagnosed much later. Hmm. Whereas anorexics will get diagnosed in teenage years or in their early 20s. Is it possible to develop the disorder um, consciously? Why? <laughs> It sounds rather convenient. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 self harm. It is self harm. In yeah. a way, yeah. it's self harm because uh, that's not the healthiest way to lose weight. To be in balance, yeah. And yeah. if it was healthy, we would recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> why not? If yeah. it was healthy, why not? But yeah. it's not healthy. It can harm you. Mm. So people have had uh, esophageal ruptures mm. because of repeated vomiting, mm. um, and there's there's a lot of issues because you don't allow the food to remain in your stomach for long enough to mm. be absorbed. Mm. Uh, so you can have malnutrition over a period of time. Mm. So there are problems that come later. Mm. So definitely not <laughs> recommended. Not recommended. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is my trauma is getting triggered. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's where I, didn't, I always feel like identifying trauma goes such a long way into solving it. Mm. Just knowing that it's there. That's it. Hmm. Most of these issues come because that trauma gets suppressed. Hmm. Um, and one of my friends told me something very interesting. That there's a difference between coping with trauma and avoiding trauma. Okay. And a lot of these illnesses, anorexia, bulimia, they're all about avoiding trauma. Hmm. Coping with trauma is dealing with trauma. Hmm. Talking about it, taking help, taking therapy, taking medications, hmm. all of that. Avoiding is... Let's eat food mm. or let's avoid food and let's make food the main focus mm. so that I don't have to think about how I didn't have control as a child. It almost feels like, you know, talking about it is, I mean, first is recognizing trauma mm. uh, and then is actually grappling with it and seeing how you can battle it. Sometimes I almost feel like the first ever therapist I went to just suggested journaling as an activity. So it almost feels like, dude, if you just journal every day, most of these issues will automatically be easier to deal with. At least you will know. Uh -huh. And you knowing is the most important thing. Mm. If parents knew how much the child is going to spend on therapy later, <laughs> they will make sure that the child journals every day. Yeah. It's just and that people didn't realize. And the act of stopping everything to just pay attention to your thoughts is actually a way of just regaining control. And that itself sometimes is enough. No? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So journaling is a, is a way of, I always think journaling is like an act of rebellion in today's world. Correct. Where everything is asking for your attention to be diverted outside. Yeah. Just paying attention to yourself. Yeah. Is an act of rebellion. It's like I'm cutting out, I'm, this is noise, noise cancellation for life. So I can just think about what I'm feeling and just even noting it down is an act of rebellion. Correct. In fact, in today's day and age, recognition of sadness itself is a big deal. Yeah. And controlling 
<clears throat> controlling any collateral damage that could occur because you're sad, like snapping at people. Correct. You know, <clears throat> I to believe that, you know, posting a story and getting likes on it is a parasympathetic activity. Yes, yeah, yeah. validation. Yeah, so I'm not wrong technically in saying that if you post a lot, it's a response to... A it's a cry for help. It's a cry for help, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a coping mechanism. <clears throat> <laughs> It's true, right? Like tweeting a lot, posting a lot. Yes. Somebody <clears throat> like me. <laughs> Somebody like me. Yeah, yeah. I want to be in parasympathetic state. Please drop a like. Guys, anyway, subscribe to this channel. <laughs> Please put me in state of parasympathetic activity. <clears throat> I love how meta this is. <laughs> All right. So now that we understand how and why, uh, how does one cope with it and how does one deal with it? I want to start off with binge eating hmm. which is how do you how do you stop it so the answer to how to cope with all three are kind of similar hmm. there are some differences uh, we'll talk about the similarities first hmm. step one is awareness hmm. step one is just knowing that this is a problem or saying that i have a problem now binge eating disorder people would be the first to admit that they have a problem yeah, is it, pro is it probably the most common in today's day and age yes. relative to the, to the other two? Yes, it is increasing. Hmm. So in the US, um, the other two are reducing. Hmm. Anorexia is reducing. Hmm. Bulimia is also reducing. Binge eating is increasing. Hmm. Uh, so definitely, yes, that's the hmm. thing. Hmm. And they will admit to it because they have shame. They are hmm. embarrassed by what they've done. Hmm. So they will admit that they have a problem. They may not seek help, but they, may, they will admit that they have a problem. Hmm. So that's probably the group that, you know, it's easiest to target. Hmm. And it's also visible. Correct, correct, correct. You can correct. tell if somebody yeah. could technically yeah, Even if it. I don't admit, my clothes are admitting. Yeah. So. Um, bulimia, they may not admit. So anorexics would not admit because hmm. in anorexia, more than the other two, the body image thing becomes a part of their ego. Hmm. So there is a term for this. If you found parasympathetic tricky, this it's called ego syntonic. Hmm. So ego syntonic means that it syncs up with your ego. Hmm. So the new body image, the the idea that I am fat and I should not be, becomes part of their identity. Hmm. So anyone who tells them otherwise hmm. becomes the enemy. Hmm. That oh, you just want me to be fat. Hmm. You are not on my side. Can't you see that I'm trying to do something that is good for me? And why aren't you supporting me? So everyone else becomes, you know, not on their side. Mm. So that's why treating anorexic patients is actually tricky because you have to convince them first mm. that they have a problem. Mm. Whereas binge eating disorder patients would be openly saying, yes, I have a problem, help. Mm. And the problem with bulimia is that diagnosis is an issue. Unless they come and tell you that they are throwing up after yeah, every meal, you'll not, never know. It's not visually apparent. Correct. You'll never know. Mm. So... I would say that the first step is to have podcasts like this, talk about this, have awareness. Family might know. Hmm. The mother, the father, the husband, uh, this partner might see this hmm. and they might have had conversations around it, but they might not have thought that this is so dangerous, hmm. especially in bulimia. Hmm. But once they have awareness around this, then hmm. they can go and seek help. Sid, there's one term here that we actually haven't touched at all, mm -hmm. which is a term called pica. Yeah. What is that? In school, have you ever come across any kid who like to eat mud? Yeah. Or chalk? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I've, I've heard of. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much what pika is. Um, eating of any substance which has no nutritional value hmm. is pika. Oh, okay. So anything that is non-food, hmm. in, in something that does not contribute to your energy levels in any way, so it's not a supplement, it's not a food, mm. but you still like to eat it. Mm. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> because I can see subtitles <laughs> under you <laughs> about the jokes you want to crack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So is this uh, disorder often seen in like infants? Not infants. Not infants. Okay. Young. When you're young. Talk. Yeah. So mm. it's interesting that you mentioned infants because the diagnosis of pica cannot be made for anyone under two years. 
Oh yeah, of course. Because kids will just pick yeah. up anything and eat it yeah, or yeah, put yeah. it in their mouth, so that doesn't yeah. matter. My dog has pika. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just put it, eat anything. Yeah, yeah. So the name, the name pika also comes from this, um, from this bird. It's a form of magpie or something hmm. that uh, literally eats anything. Okay. And so that's where the name comes from. That hmm. oh, you're eating like a pika. Ah, okay. It's got no meaning. So you eat a plastic hmm. cup or whatever. Um, so pe- pe- uh, patients who have this disorder hmm. will eat things like mud, chalk, hmm. hair. Um, hmm. They'll just chew hair and they'll swallow it. Hmm. Um, they might eat plastic. They might eat paper. Hmm. Random things. Hmm. Um, and initially, it was thought that when you say eat, do you mean chew or swallow? Chew and swallow. chew and swallow yeah. like for example when i am in an intense state of thinking i'll sometimes just chew my t-shirt yes but that's not pika that's not pika no that is just oral that's fixation that's like a coping mechanism oral fixation oral fixation can you draw the distinction between uh, pika and oral fixation like why does why is there oral fixation again it's something to do with uh, you want to be in a state of s- sympathetic Activity. That's why you chew something. Yes, it makes we you spoke feel about this also. So we spoke about this last time. Anything right? in your perioral area yeah, uh, yeah. can stimulate parasympathetic system. Correct, correct, correct. correct. Um, okay, good. That's that's oral oral fixation. But correct. Pika occurs why? Where you pika is where you swallow. Yeah, but why? And that's it's a coping mechanism again. Okay. But uh, slightly more deeper down into the psychological problem state. Hmm. So there are different kinds of pika. Depending on what you eat, hmm. it could be harmless. Hmm. um or it could be very harmful hmm. so people who swallow hair for example hmm. have had serious issues because the hair goes and literally clogs up your hmm. intestine like, like your a drain drain yeah yes yeah, yeah. and pe- they've had to undergo surgery where oh, they wow. take out this whole ball of hair yeah, yeah because it was obstructed yeah cats are okay i guess yeah <laughs> cats yeah. are still fine yeah pretty much so uh the reasons would be the same hmm. again some kind of childhood issues and environmental problems earlier they used to think that maybe there's some deficiency hmm. so they noticed that people with iron deficiency anemia hmm. with less iron in their body hmm. would tend to eat mud hmm. uh, to the point where at one point it was like a diagnostic thing that hmm. oh do you eat mud let me check your iron, iron. levels okay got it um but now that distinction that association has gone away hmm. because we don't really know if it's the cause or effect Hmm. because sometimes eating mud can lead to less absorption of iron hmm. so it could got be that it, uh, it. it could be the other way also hmm. uh, but anybody who's doing this should undergo some kind of psychological testing and uh, this is different from the other diseases we spoke about hmm. uh, because their their relationship with normal food is still okay hmm. it's just that they have developed this kind of abnormal fixation towards some things which are not food Hmm. So this almost becomes like a, a like a tick. Like hmm. they need to eat it. Hmm. Uh, it becomes a compulsion. Hmm. So people who have pika and they are not allowed to eat that thing that they want to eat, hmm. they feel uncomfortable. And hmm. then as soon as they start chewing on it, some chalk or whatever, they hmm. will feel better. So it hmm. becomes like a compulsion. Is this the least common of the four? Uh, no, actually, um, it is. It is common. Uh, overall eating disorders are less common than the other psychiatric problems hmm. so d- if you compare it with depression anxiety got it, got it. this is still much less common hmm. um but the association between eating disorders and other mental illnesses are very high hmm. so somebody with anorexia or bulimia hmm. will have a much higher chance of having anxiety and depression correct yeah makes basically their affinity towards being in a sympathetic state is much higher Yes, you can say consistent that. sympathetic state. So they will have um, because all of them have the have a similar starting point, mm. right? Uncontrolled stress mm. is the starting point for a lot of these problems. तू building में है अलग अलग floor पे. हाँ, तुम कहाँ पे lift से उतरोगे? That's yeah. a different thing. Yeah. But uh, the it's the same fundamental issues. Mm. One way to think of it is that your house is on fire mm. and you're trying to run out. Hmm. which door you take which door you take yeah kind of depends in the moment yeah right so there are all different coping mechanisms yeah and at what point what system will fail 
hmm. is kind of up to that brain hmm. and some amount of genetics some amount of environment hmm. how loving the parents are how supportive their you know uh, family is hmm. so it depends on that particular child story hmm. but uh, the starting points are similar hmm. yeah okay now that we understood uh these are a different types of eating disorders this is why they happen uh, how does one cope so starting point again as like i said is awareness hmm. you need to know that i could have this issue hmm. ideally you should visit an eating clinic like an eating disorder clinic oh those exist yes um not as much as they should especially hmm. in india hmm. uh, but abroad yes they do and in india i would say the first best step would be to visit a psychiatrist hmm get yourself analyzed mm. because it's very likely that you might have some underlying anxiety or depression mm. along with an eating disorder mm. but the diagnosis of an eating disorder because this is at the junction of multiple fields mm. or an ideal eating disorder clinic would have a psychiatrist a psychologist a counselor uh, someone who's a therapist and they would have a nutritionist to mm. check and go over your diet plans and they would have a rehabilitation specialist mm. because you have to get back into your everyday life correct and the kind of exercise that you do would have to be tailor made for you mm. and you might need a physician mm. because a lot of these people will have malnutrition they will have anemia they'll have a lot of thyroid issues so you'll need a general physician to take care of you know the whole thing mm. so that's the number of patients people who will need to come together to take mm. care of a eating disorder patient. Hmm. Okay, but how how does one you visit a clinic and yeah. then like can you tell me a little bit about how okay, let's take binge eating for example. Yeah. Have you ever treated anyone with this disorder and or know of the procedure? I have known of patients who have done that. Hmm. Uh so I am a neurologist so I don't treat hmm. binge eating disorders myself. Hmm. But uh, the way to deal with it is there are different approaches you can take depending on that patient. Hmm. So one of them say is aversive therapy. Hmm. Binge eating is the problem. Uh, they will, whenever they are stressed, they turn towards food. Hmm. Why not make food less appealing to them hmm. and give more appealing options? Hmm. So, sort of like how you did it with badminton, hmm. except you came to that by yourself. Hmm. But aversive therapy would mean that whenever you think of food, you shouldn't feel so drawn to it. Now, there are ways of doing this. Hmm. the other one is cognitive behavioral therapy mm. go back into how do you think about food and change that mm. the other is narrative therapy mm. what is this story that you've created that you are somebody who needs to eat food to feel better where did that story come from change that mm. there are all different forms of therapy mm. to essentially change the way you think about mm. food mm. so that is in binge eating disorder mm. for bulimia and anorexia it is more complex mm. because for those pe- uh, people you need to you may have to undergo scopies hmm. you may have to check how your esophagus is you may have to check your blood tests all of hmm. that hmm. um and the other important thing is and i, I remember a question about uh, this the connection between binge eating obesity and all the problems that obesity comes with hmm. that's a whole other thing hmm. so diabetes blood pressure thyroid all of that needs to be checked in every every person with eating disorder hmm. that's the spectrum of treatment hmm. okay is uh, like i just had a random question which is that binge eating is also like it's a disorder but also like a form of addiction is an addiction also a disorder in that sense yeah here we go into the spectrum hmm. you know the spectrum conversation hmm. so there are a few spectrums here one is binge eating is on the same spectrum as bulimia hmm. because bulimics might also binge eat Mm. but bulimia is on the same same spectrum as anorexia because they're both obsessed with weight mm. anorexia is on the same spectrum as ocd correct mm. because both of them have control issues mm. so when they did personality tests mm. there was a difference between patients of bulimia and anorexia mm. so anorexics are a lot more rigid mm. they don't want to think too laterally they have control issues the way they're very punctual they are very specific about things they're very specific about deadlines they want everything to be in the way that they want it which means that they are great at following certain orders but when they may they may not do very well in creative fields mm. where they have to deal with chaos um 
bulimia patients might be more prone to sudden uh, sudden spurts of okay let's enjoy let's go out because that's the phases that coincide with their binge eating phases mm. and because anorexia and ocd have a lot in common mm. they are both control freaks mm. right so they have both have control issues so ocd has a lot of compulsion but so does binge eating and pica mm. so this is where the spectrum comes in Hmm. all of these merge into one another hmm. and because their ultimate uh, presentations are so different they were diagnosed separately hmm. but that's how mental health needs to be looked at correct correct correct, correct. anyway uh, for everyone who watched this hope that you didn't hard relate uh, yeah i hope so too yeah i hope you didn't hard relate uh, but and or if you did then now you know where it stems from and what you can do um, about it uh sit thank you very much very informative once again and uh, therapeutic for me to some degree <laughs> do yeah. do subscribe to hit like on this video uh, there's more stuff with sit coming up on this very channel and see you next time cheers